Well, uh, Mark, Brother Mark brought up perfection in his, uh, in his little talk there, and we're going to be talking about perfection right now. You know, I, I think we have this love-hate relationship with perfection, don't we? Because um, it's not like when you, you go somewhere, it's not like you say, oh, I don't want this to be perfect, right? You want the restaurant to, to have the perfect atmosphere. You want the food to be served just the way you like it. You want the music to be just the kind of music you like. You want, so so we, we, we want that perfect experience when we go out. We, we want the car that we drive to, to feel, you want to feel that power when, when, you, when you put down the gas pedal, right? You want that perfect feel. And if it starts making other noises, what are you going to do? You're going to take it back to the dealer and say, what's up? You know, this car is supposed to, to be running perfectly, right? And, and, and so we want our phones. You know, we, every time we update our phones, sometimes we get a little annoyed, right? Because they change it. And, and we're like, ah, I got to learn it all over again. It was perfect before. Uh, and, and, and so we, we, we do desire perfection. Uh, you know, you go to an event, right? And, and we, we, you know, there's a lot of events. There's a lot of activities that that are, are judging perfection. I mean, how many of you, I mean, kind of like a, a beauty pageant, right? I mean, that's probably not maybe as uh, popular as they used to be, but I think Miss Universe is still a thing, right? And, and, and so people, all the ladies, they, they get dressed up and they're competing with each other to see who's going to be Miss Universe, who's going to be the perfect model, uh, then we have, you know, the, the performance type of perfection, right? Like figure skating or gymnastics seem to be based on that scale of 1 to 10. And all these gymnasts and, and figure skaters are trying to do that perfect presentation. Um, you think about etiquette, right? When you go out to eat, we teach our kids how to behave in public, right? Because we want them to act like perfect little kids when we go out. We don't want to be the parents that are pulling our hairs out trying to, to keep our kids from, from running the place um, out of business. And, uh, and, and yet, a lot the, the thing that we struggle the most with, though, is it those other kind of perfections, even though there's probably uh, a negative side to those as well, it's when it comes to character. That's, that's where we start saying, wait a minute. I like everything else perfect, but don't expect me to be perfect, right? <laughs> um, and, and so th- this has caused a lot of problems in the church, let's be honest. The idea that we must be perfect before Jesus come has led many people to give up the race before they cross the finish line. They start looking at themselves after a while. I've been in the church for a few years. I don't think I'm any more perfect than I was before. I must be doing something wrong. I must not be good enough. You know, there was a book written uh, about, I guess it's been almost 30 years now, uh, by a man named George Knight, and the book is called I Used to Be Perfect. Maybe some of you have, have read it. It's worth, a, it's worth your time. It's a short book. And, and he's, it's kind of a testimony about how he, when he came into the church, he tried to do everything right, tried to do everything perfect. And eventually he got so discouraged that he totally left the church, left the ministry. He was a pastor and uh, just gave up on all of it because he said, I, if I can't be perfect, then I'm just just not good enough. I'm not even going to try. So, so that story has been repeated by many others, right? So, so, so the, the truth is when it comes to perfection in the church, when it comes to character perfection, when we focus on the outward, it can become toxic, right? Because what it comes down to then is it becomes a show, right? It becomes a show, just like we just mentioned, right? The, a beauty pageant is a what? It's a show. A figure skater competition is a show. When we go out to eat and we're, we're trying to look our best, it's a show, right? It's not how we eat at home, <laughs> right? <laughs> we, eat with a, you know, we eat all over the place. When we're out and we're people, oh, we're going to eat all this perfect. Right? We're going to put on a show. 
And, and, and so that's essentially what happens when we have the wrong perception of perfection. It becomes a show, and it becomes misery to those who have to live that show every single day. And so am I saying perfection is impossible? Well, no. But what I am saying is that per- the, the perception that most people have of biblical per- of perfection is, I'm getting my words <laughs> uh, mixed up here, the, the perception that most people have of biblical perfection leads to uh, two things. It leads to either competing with each other or resigning because we just can't keep up. So how do we tackle this problem of Christian perfection without losing hope in the process? We're going to be uh, covering that in our last presentation in this series, Raising the Bar, with a sermon entitled The Perfect Perfection <laughs> Misconception. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity today to spend some time studying the Bible again. Lord, we, we don't want to be in a competition. Lord, we don't want to put on a show. Uh, Lord, we want to experience the reality of what your word says to us. Lord, so I pray that today we will get a better understanding of this topic of perfection and that um, it will give us hope as we move forward to your soon coming. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, as you know, this whole series has been Jesus rebuking kind of this attitude of perfection, right? Perfection was the, was the culture of the Pharisees, right? They, they wanted to do everything perfect. I mean, there was a saying, if, if all the Jews could just keep the Sabbath perfectly for one day, then the Messiah would come. So there's all these ideas that it's about performance. And, and so they're, they're, they were very rigid when it came to, the, specifically, their performance when it came to cleanliness, right? When it came to uh, ritual cleanliness. And so they would practice all these things to, to be outwardly pure and holy and look good. And, and Jesus, all throughout his ministry, was trying to get to the heart of the matter and saying, look, this outward show isn't doing anyone any good. And so the Sermon on the Mount is his rebuke of perfection as a means of salvation, okay? And so he, because everything they thought they were doing well, he raises the bar so high that none of them can think, oh, I can do this on my own. I'm, I'm good enough. And, and I, can, I can just try harder. And I, I, that Jesus is like, stop. Stop this. This is nonsense. The only way that you are going to, to be saved is if you reach way up here and all of you are down here. So then what are you going to do about it? <laughs> and, of course, the purpose is not to discourage. The purpose of the Sermon on the Mount is to point people to their need that they can't do it, and that they need to depend on God. And so we've been going throughout this series. If you've missed it, this is part eight. They're all up on our YouTube channel or our website, fortmyerschurch.com. I encourage you to check it out. Um, But let's conclude the series by looking at another uh, difficult passage in Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 43. And Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than the others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your heavenly Father is perfect. 
Oof. So that's another one of those hard sayings of Jesus, right? You have heard it said, shall love your brother and hate your enemy. Um, and, and, and so again, he's challenging us. I mean, how many of us are actively praying for the people that we despise? <laughs> or, that, or for the people that despise us, right? I guess that's a better way. Um, you can't pray for someone that you hate, right? You literally can't do that. And, and, and so, so Jesus here is, is raising the bar again. He says, look, you think you're that good, but you're only good to the people who are good to you. You only greet the people who greet you. So what good does that actually make you then, right? You know, it's, we think we're friendly. Why? Because somebody waved at us and we waved back. But what happened about to the guy that, that cut you off, right? What did you do to him or her? <laughs> did you wave in with a different finger <laughs> in your hand? <laughs> you know, what, what, where is our heart, right? And, and that's what Jesus is getting to the point here. He is showing us what perfection actually looks like, right? And, and so from this passage, we can see that, that perfection is not about focusing on ourselves, because that's going to automatically lead to performance, right? And comparing ourselves with others. And the moment I am focused on my own performance, then I start focusing on everybody else's. And, and I, have to, I, I have to do this all the time. I have to check myself. Like, so I've been doing a lot of social, mini, mini, social media ministry, right? And, and so I'm, I put out a video and, and praise the Lord. But what happens? I end up inevitably checking the stats, right? And, and, and then I'm comparing how my video did against some other person's video or my video from a video I posted last week. And, and if my self-worth is dependent on the number of likes or views of my video, then my whole mood is going to be changed based on how that video does for that day. Amen. And you can apply that to anything that you're doing, right? That, that goes, right? But if what I'm doing is, is because it is, I believe in what I'm doing and, I, and I'm not focused on how it makes me look, but I'm focused on the actual process itself, then I can be free of the results because I'm saying I'm doing what God asked me to do and, and however he chooses to use it, I'm okay with, right? So those are two totally different mindsets that one, I can walk through the day every day in peace and freedom because it's not my job, God, what you do with what I produce, right? But the other is, oh, well, let me, and I'm looking over my shoulder and seeing what my brother and sister are doing. It's the same thing when we're trying to, to, to be perfect, right? And so this is one of the important principles when it comes to Christian perfection. Perfection is not self-focused, right? Amen. Biblical perfection is not self-focused, Biblical perfection is always focused on, on others, right? It's always focused on others, right? So how I treat others is more of a reflection of who I am, right, than, than my behavior day to day, right? Because I don't do this, or I don't do that, or I do this, I do that. Look, that's I'm not saying self-improvement is bad, but when we get a, a level of, of feeling righteous by it, feeling good that somehow God perceives me differently because of what I do or don't do, then we're going to be subject to fall into the trap of perfectionism. We want that dopamine hit. We want to feel like we're better than others. But Jesus here is telling us that the definition of perfection is love, friends. Loving your 
friends, of course, but also loving your enemies, right? The standard for perfection is love. And it's, so it's not super complicated here. It, it's, um, you know, sometimes we're like, oh, I can, I can be perfect if I, as long as I'm in the right environment. Well, then who's in control? You're trying to control your environment, trying to control the people that you're around. And of course, if you do that, then you can sustain a certain behavioral standard that may look holy and righteous on the outside. But God is saying here is how you measure what is going on inside of you is when you're in situations that are out of your control, you're with people you don't really like and don't really like you, but how do you treat them? How do you relate to them? And, and how do you relate to those around you when things aren't going your way? So that is going to be the measure that, that uh, is, it, it would line up with what Jesus is trying to teach here. Um, and, and so we, we think about love. We think about the love of God. And of course, what comes to mind? John chapter 3, verse 16, right? For God so what? Love the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? So the standard for perfection is the love of God, right? God loved us before we loved him. He loved us when we were still his enemies. And, and so, but that re- love that we don't deserve awakens love in us. And so that's how we can attain what Jesus is saying here. We can't focus on ourselves, our love. No, no. We have to focus on his love. When we focus on the love of God for us, then that changes our heart so that we can love each other. And so perfection is not our behavior. Perfection is love. Yes, love will produce a behavior, but it's th- that's not the point. The point is that love is the transforming agent that turns us and transforms us into the image of God. There's this beautiful quote here from Mount of Blessings, um, and it says here, love is the agent which he uses to expel sin from the heart. By it, he changes pride into humility and enmity and unbelief into love and faith. Isn't that beautiful? So, as you can see, it's not anything that we can do for ourselves that is going to change what we're doing. It's only as we focus on the love of God, right? The love of Jesus for us. That agape love is the love that Jesus is, is, is telling us. That's the standard, friend. The standard is agape love. And if you love your enemy, then you are loving like I loved you. Because when I, when, when I loved you, you didn't love me in return. But my love for you transformed you so that you could love. And guess what, friends? Your love for someone who doesn't love you in return has the power to transform. Amen. You, because love transforms hearts. It truly does. People that receive love when they don't deserve it or don't feel like they, they uh, are worthy of it. it, it does something from them. It's like pouring water on a wilted plant. It, 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 it is the source that God wants for you and me to live with. And, uh, and so we, we find that, that uh, there's one story in the Bible that, I mean, there could have been many others, that, that demonstrate this idea that Jesus was, was teaching here in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, it's found in... Um, see my wrong <laughs> what just happened okay here we go <laughs> all right it says Matthew chapter 19 verses 16 through 22 it says now behold one came and said to him good teacher what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life so he said to him why do you call me good no one is good but one that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? All 
All right, I guess I have to use my finger. Jesus said to him, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these things I have kept from my youth, what still do I lack? And then Jesus said, if you want to be what, friends? There it is, right? If you want to be perfect... Go, sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Wow. So this story has been interpreted in a lot of different ways, and I'm sure there are different angles that you could take with this story. But... What I'd like to, to present is that the, the rich young ruler had a perception about himself that he was perfect, right? Or at least that was the, the image that, that he was trying to present to the world. And, and a lot of people probably thought he was, right? Because he had everything going for him. He was rich, which automatically meant that people would have considered him blessed by God. He was young, right? So he had his whole life in front of him, and he was a ruler. So he had a position of power. So he had all those things, and, and based on how he answered Jesus' questions, he believed he was what? He thought he was righteous. He thought he was good. But yet, something wasn't right in him, or else he wouldn't have asked Jesus the question to begin with, right? So somehow deep in his heart, he knew that even though outwardly everybody else thought he was a great person, outwardly everybody thought that he had it all figured out, and, and so many people not only admired him but wanted to be him, right? And yet something was missing in his heart because he wasn't perfect, right? And he deep down knew that he wasn't perfect. And, and so Jesus is trying to help him understand what he was truly missing, right? And so when Jesus said, go and sell all you have and give to the poor and come follow me, what is he getting at here? He's getting at the, the heart of what he was depending on. He was depending on these outward things to make him look good in front of everybody else. And so his whole self-perception was based on these, these gifts, these talents that he'd been given, these, these blessings. And Jesus says, no, no, you, you can't base your perfection just because you're more talented than somebody else, because you're more beautiful or handsome than someone else, because you're smarter at math. You, you know, all the gifts that God's given us, we kind of hold on to those things, and we're proud of those things. And God says, yes, I've gifted you in those areas, but those things don't make you perfect. Right? Those things don't make you more valuable than others who may not have the gifts that you have. Right? So don't hold on to those things as, as a badge of honor. When you're standing before me, I can see through. I know what is going on in your heart and how you treat others. How you treat others, especially those who are different than you, especially those that you perceive as your enemy, that is the true test. That's the true test of what's going on in here. And, and, and when Jesus pulled away all of the, the outward show and got to the heart with the rich young ruler and he realized what it took to truly be perfect, which was to give up self and to depend wholly on God for salvation and not his own works, he went away sorrowful. He walked away from salvation. He walked away from being a disciple. Jesus asked him to follow him. He didn't expect him to be perfect, but he knew by following him he would be, right? Because that was the whole point, that Jesus believed his disciples would do the things that he did. And he believes that about you and me. When we follow Jesus, we will be able to do the things that he did. Not because of us, 
but because his perfect life has been transferred into our imperfect life, right? He exchanges his perfection for our imperfection. That's the gospel, friends. He took our imperfection on the cross, he died for it, and he rose again to give us his perfection. And it's not just a a uh, imputed perfection that that God writes, you know, forgiven over the sins of your in heaven. That's that's important. But he really truly gives you love. He gives you love. That is the way that you know that you have received salvation. God implants love in your heart. And if you don't have love in your heart, you don't have Jesus in your heart. No matter what you believe, no matter how good you look on the outside. This thing really doesn't want to work. All right. So, the point here is we overcome by focusing on the solution, not the problem. You and this is when it comes down to overcoming sin in your life, right? I, I mean, I've met people before that talk, and they go through a list of all the sins they've overcome. Friend, don't ever do that. <laughs> don't ever list the sins that you've overcome in a way that, that per- makes it perceive that, that you are um, free of sin, right? Focus on the person that you have become in Christ, right? Like, if focus on the way that God has changed your heart and what you do now that you didn't do before in terms of love, right? Yeah, maybe you don't drink and smoke anymore. Praise the Lord. That's not a bad thing to say, but have you, do you also love your children more? Do you love your wife more? Do you, are you a better person at work? You know, those are the things that really quantify the, the Christian experience in your life. And so when we focus on Jesus then and not our sin, then the sin problem is taken care of on its own. But when we focus on our sin, then automatically we're going to get into that competition. Look at me. Or we're going to get into the resignation. Oh, I can't do this. I'll never be good enough. I'm just going to give up. Right? God doesn't want you competing to be super Christian. <laughs> he doesn't want you to give up either because you're struggling. He says, no, focus on me. Focus on my love. When my love is implanted in your heart, sin is expelled. Amen. So all the sin... So you may focus on one. God says, I don't, want, I don't want to just get rid of one sin out of your life. I want all the sin out of your life. But if you're just focusing on that one sin, you're missing all the other. So just focus on my love and my salvation for you, and I'll take care of all of it for you. See, it's so much better when we let Jesus do the work and, instead of letting us try to do it. And, and, and so how, this is what the point that he was trying to make to, to Paul when he said, uh, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me, friends. So that's really what the communion service is all about today. You know, we're going to be washing each other's feet this time. This is a, an ordinance of humility. It's an ordinance where we recognize that we can't. I'm not, I, I, I'm not better than my brother or my sister. I'm going to bow down and kneel down and wash my brother's feet. Just like Jesus kneeled down and washed the feet of Peter. You know? And so when we go back and we, we partake in this service, the ordinance of humility is designed to prepare our hearts so that we recognize that it's not about our performance, it's about Christ's performance for us. And that's what the communion bread and the wine represents. When we take Christ in us, then we have his power, his perfection, his love living through us. So we're going to separate at this time, and when we come back in, we're going to encourage you to sit on the aisles with a dot on them um, and leave the aisles free for the deacons that don't have a dot. Uh, We're going to be uh, washing feet in the fellowship hall, 
And uh, there's going to be a section there for families if you want to wash, have a family washing. Um, there's also going to be a section for men to wash men's feet and women to wash women's feet. And uh, if you want to um, stay here in the sanctuary, that's your choice too. You're welcome to do that. And we will um, have the, the communion service um, right after the Ordinance of Humility. So God bless you, and we'll see you back in here in a few minutes.